The book of Philippians, I want you to write this in the, the top part of your uh, book there, is all about the power of Christ. And you guys know that I usually, at least in the epistles, try to write down that one word that helps me remember what the books or what the epistles are really all about. And we saw um, Galatians being all about the grace of God. We see that Ephesians is about the church of Christ and Colossians about the Christ of the church. Philippians is really all about the power of of Christ. And if you just write that word power there. And what that does is that helps you remember that as we read through the book of Philippians, we need to remember that Jesus Christ is powerful, that he has a lot of power in his name. And really he gives that power to us as believers in him. And one of the most well-known scriptures being Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? You guys all know that verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that is definitely power. It's been called Paul's most personal letter, the book of Philippians. And really what it is, is it, it is just this genuine love that we see from Paul to the church there in Philippi. It is just genuine friendship is what it is. You know, I've been reading over this book and reading over the chapters just time and time again, just studying and, I, and just kind of trying to soak it all in. And really it just hit me like, man, Lord, this is just genuine friendship is what it is between Paul and the church in Philippi. It's just it is this personal letter between friends. And Acts chapter 16 tells all about Paul's first meeting with the church there in Philippi. Again, if you want to write that down, you can go back later on and read Acts chapter 16 and see the first time that Paul actually had the opportunity to go to Philippi and minister to them and meet the women as it says that they were out meeting at the river's side, at the river's edge as they would go out there and they would just pray and gather together as a group of believers. And it's so neat that at that time, Paul just began to minister to them. And hey, guys, what's going on? And can I pray with you? And can we minister together and talk about Jesus? And we see 10 years later, this church that began to develop and grow. And even in verse 1 of Philippians chapter 1, it speaks about the deacons and the bishops. So we see this natural growth of a church that began to be established. And that's really what happens, right, when we get into the word of God, when God begins to minister to us, when God begins to work within a, a, a fellowship or within a body of people, within friends, we begin to see this development. We begin to see this, uh, this natural growth. And this is what we see in the book of Philippians. And I want to uh, just read verse 27 to you really quick from chapter one, if you want to read that with me. It says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs. <clears throat> it says that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul here at this time is writing from prison in Rome to this church that he loves so much. And after he greets them and he reminisces with them a little bit and just kind of, you know, says hello and, and, you know, has that encouragement for them. He really begins to set up chapter two and really the rest of the book of Philippians here at the end of chapter one. And essentially he, what he says here in chapter one is that because of what I've been through, because of what I've gone through, because I'm here even in my chains, because of what Christ has done in me, because of who I have become. And then he says there in verse 22, now only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Now you walk according to the word of God. Read the word of God. Study the word of God. Know the word of God. And walk according to what it says. Why? Because of who Christ is and because of the power that we find in him. You know, it's really easy to walk according to the word of God when the pastor's around, right? It's like pastor's around and we're just like on our best behavior. You know, we're always like, God bless you and praise Jesus, you know, and let's all come together and pray. Can we pray right now? You know, we get the Christianese as it's called. And then pastor leaves the room and what happens? You know, the fun begins, right? We all start acting like children and stuff. And it's just like Paul's saying, man, I take so much joy in you guys and you Philippians because you've just strive, you strive together, whether in my presence or when I'm not there. And he encourages them. He says, you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together 
for the faith of the gospel. You know, we've been using that word a lot here. That word unity, right? You've heard that being used lately. Being like-minded. Being in one accord. Having that one mind. And how should the church here in Philippi walk in unity? Because this is what Paul is really speaking about here in chapter 2 is really unity. And how does the church do it? Well, one way is through humility. One way is through humility. Let's go ahead and read verse 1 again in chapter 2. It says, therefore, therefore. That word therefore is used six times here in chapter 2. Every time you see it, I just want you to underline it or put a box around it in your Bible. Make those little notes, you know, that help you study these chapters. And it's used six times. And every time you hear that word therefore, you hear a lot of pastors always point that word out. Some pastors always say, whenever you see, therefore, you have to ask yourself, wherefore, you know, you got to go back and look at the wherefores, you know, well, where, wherefore, where am I looking at? Or they say, uh, anytime you hear the word, therefore, you have to say, what is it therefore, you know, look into it a little bit more. And really it just means because of, right? Because of these things that we've just read, you know, because of what has just happened now, therefore. And again, it's used six times that Paul encourages them in this way. Because of this, now we need to do this. And he says this, Therefore, if there is any consolation or comfort in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. Let's stop there. Paul begins with some rhetorical questions here, right? Therefore, if there's any of these things, if any of these are true, basically, is what he's saying, right? And he starts off with the first thing. He says, if there's any consolation or comfort in Christ. Is there any comfort in Christ? Anyone here ever experienced comfort in Christ? Yes? Second Corinthians 1, 13 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. The God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. Anyone ever been comforted by God? You know, we can be in those lows. We can be in those spots where it's just like, man, Lord, what is going on? Why, Lord, am I going through this right now in life? Why am I here right now? And what happens? We just open up our Bible. We begin to read the word. We go back to those verses. We turn on the worship music. We sit down and we meditate on God. And what happens? He just begins to comfort us, right? He begins to just relax us and just give us that peace and comfort that we find in him. And the reality of the situation really becomes real to us. You know, that hope that we have in the Lord through eternity. And he just says, man, it's going to be okay. Whether in this life or the next, it's going to be okay. This is the comfort that is received in the Lord. He says, if any comfort of love, if there's any comfort of love, anyone experience comfort of love through the Lord? Yes, hopefully. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 says, love never fails. Love never fails. And you might say, ah, yes, I don't know about that. I've been burned so many times by people. Love has failed so often in my life. Love always fails, you know, it seems like is the truth. And I would say, no, true love never fails. The Lord's love never fails. Yes, the world's love will fail you. It will let you down. It will leave you burned. But the true love that God has for you never fails. Why? Because love is patient. Love is kind. Love is long-suffering. You know, love, love, is, love is, I said kind already, huh? It's gentle. It's all the things that we find there in 1 Corinthians. And that love never fails us. It's that true love that we find in Jesus. I fell out of love. No, you fell out of lust. You need to find that love again that we have in the Lord. And Paul says, if there's any comfort of love. Anyone experience love in the Lord? Comfort of love? Yes? Can I get a yes if you've received it? Just to make sure you're alive and breathing. Make sure I don't have to call 911 right now for CPR. He says, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit... Any fellowship of the Spirit. Through Christ, we find koinonia, right? We find that koinonia, that communion, that, that connection that we have with the Lord, the breaking of bread with others. You know, we find this fellowship that we have with other believers. And it's neat because we get a, you know, go someplace and you just find this believer that you just sense is a believer and, you know, or, or some type of Christian thing and you just have this connection with them. 
And, you know, you feel like you've known them forever, you know, and you just relate in so many ways. And it's just that communion, it's that fellowship through the spirit that God connects you with other believers with. And it's just so neat. And then we also see that with the Lord as well as we just get to meditate on the Lord and we just feel that connection with the Lord. Again, that fellowship through the Spirit. And he says, if you've ever had that, if this is true, if this is real. And the last thing he says, if there's been any affection and mercy and mercy. Anyone here ever experienced any mercy? Or do you guys ever always get what you deserve in life? I don't think so, huh? We always get that mercy. We always, you know, want justice for everyone else. And then we want mercy when it comes to me. And we just find such amazing mercy through Jesus, don't we? He just continues and continues and continues to give us mercy in, it, in this life and definitely in the next. So Paul is saying that if these things are true, if these things are real, and I think that we can all admit right now that yes, they are. He says then here in verse two, he says, then fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Paul says, man, you would make me so happy. Man, you would just give me so much joy because of Christ, because of the comfort, because of love, because of fellowship. If you would get this, if you would get along, that's it. That's all he says. It's that simple. You know, sometimes we read the word and, and you know, we read it in the New King James or the, even the King James and we go, man, this is so deep and spiritual and, you know, how do I grasp this Lord? And so many times it's really just so simple, you know. Paul just says, just, just get along, <laughs> you know. Just have some unity. That's it. And we go, now, Paul, man, I don't know. You're asking for a lot now. Get along. Oof. Have you seen who I'm trying to work with? Have you seen how they act, Paul? And he says, no, that same love that you've received, that same love that you've been shown through Christ, he says it would make me so happy if you would just show it to others. If you would just show it to other believers. Be of one accord, he says. Be of one mind. How? How is this done? You know, it's not done necessarily just by, okay, let's all jump on the same page and all have the same goal or all have, you know, let's do things the exact same way of everyone else and, you know, and, and all that. It doesn't mean that we all become the same person or have the same likes or talents, but it just means that we allow the thing that brought us together to keep us together. We allow that love, we allow that mercy and that grace the same thing that brought us together as believers to be within every situation that we now go through in this life and we allow those things to then keep us together as believers. That as we begin to have differences, that as we begin to argue about the scriptures or argue about the way things are, are, are handled, that we go back and we say, hey, remember the mercy that you were once shown? Remember the love, the comfort that I once received, that we would then allow it to play a part there in that situation as well. The comfort, the love, the fellowship, the mercy. Verse three says this, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. What a contrast that we see here in the book of Philippians than what we saw in Galatians or that we see in Corinthians. You know, in Corinthians, we saw a church that was just falling apart because of sin. A church that was just falling apart because of, you know, this sin that they allowed within their church and, the, and the, the, you know, maybe a little too much grace that they were having upon people. And, and, and we just saw this rebuke that Paul had to write to them. And in Galatians, we saw a church that, that was falling away, that was leaving the grace of God. They were actually going the opposite way, right, from the Corinthian church. They were leaving the grace of God and salvation through grace and they were basing it all upon works. But what a contrast that we see now here in the book of Philippians where Paul just says, man, you guys have all these things down. He says, now he's all, you know what? I just, I just want you guys to just get along. I just want you guys to just not be selfish. 
I just want you guys to put everyone else before you. He says, get rid of the selfish ambitions. Get rid of the conceit. Get rid of the self-esteem. And he says, esteem everyone else better than himself. They just had everything else taken care of. And that's, that is so neat to see that within a church. You know, what would Paul say if he wrote a letter to the church here at Calvary Chapel Inland? What would he say to us? What would he say to you? You know, would it be a warning against sin? Would it be like that letter to the church of Corinthians? Would it be a, be, would it be a rebuke? Would it be a caution? Would it be a caution against, you know, uh, leaving doctrinal foundations and, and biblical foundations and truths? Would it have to be a rebuke in that area that, hey, please read your Bible, seek after the Lord? Or would it be encouragement for unity? Would it be one that calls for a deeper fellowship, deeper relationships with one another? Would it be a little bit of each? Do you need correction to get out of sin? Then get out of sin. Get out of sin. If there's something that you are dealing with, then stop and give it to the Lord. Do you need to walk according to the biblical doctrines? Then read your Bible. Seek after truth. Find out what that truth is. Make it a point in your life that this next year I will read through the entire Bible. I will go through the whole Bible and I will seek after God and allow him to minister to me. Or do you need to be united to other believers? Are you constantly living a life full of criticism and full of disunity and that it just feels like, you know, that you just need comfort and joy and fellowship with the believers? Then listen to what Paul would say. He says there in verse five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. So Jesus Christ, who was God in the flesh, who sat and designed life as we know it, right? With the Father. He sat in the heavens and he said with, with God, he said, let us make man in our image. He sat there and he breathed life into us. God. It says that as he made himself equal with God, he didn't even see it as robbery. He wasn't taking anything away from God because of who he is. Someone else tried that once, right? And they got cast out of heaven with a third of the angels. And yet for Jesus, it was completely okay. You know, but what did Christ do with all that power, with all that might? What did he do with everything, with all that opportunity that he had at his very fingertips? It says, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. All that power, all that prestige, all that might, and yet he gave it up and he made himself as a slave as a slave, you would think maybe, maybe a king, Lord. Maybe come as a king, you know, maybe come as a ruler and just show, show your honor and just show your glory. Maybe come as, you know, a decorated war hero and show your might and show your strength to us. No, a slave. He humbled himself. It says, even to the point of death, he even put himself under the curse of sin. And not just any death, it says the death of the cross. That death that was the worst death imaginable. The death that was saved for criminals. You know, one of the most important parts of a resume is what? 
your, your job experience, right? Your accolades, you know, what you've accomplished in this life, your awards, your achievements, you know, where you've come from and just that experience that you have. And, and, and you know, we've been taught our whole lives that we need to sell ourselves, right? We need to always sell ourselves and, and, and speak of our, you know, the, the, uh, how awesome we are. And sometimes we allow that type of attitude to just, uh, to just creep into every other aspect in our lives. And we allow it to even come into the way that we deal with people. You know, I've, I have this much experience. I've been a manager for 10 years. I've managed this many people. You know, I have a degree. We always want to talk about how great we are. You know, for Jesus, it was like, he just simply said, I'm God. <laughs> that was it. This is who I am. You want to know who I am? I'm God. He had every, every right. And yet he humbled himself. And yet he gave it all up to come to this earth. But look what the father did through his humility. This is neat. He says there in verse nine, therefore, there's that word again. God also has highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father, the father, it says, lifted him up that the, at the very mention of his name, that every knee across this earth, every knee in heaven. And it even says every knee under the earth will one day bow at the very sound of his name. This is what God did with Jesus's humility. This is what the father did because Jesus was willing to humble himself. Proverbs 11, two says, when pride comes, then comes shame. But when the, but with the humble is wisdom. Pride comes, you want to be prideful, then comes shame. You want to be humble? There's wisdom in that. Proverbs 29, 23 says, a man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. You will be honored when you have humility. James 4.10 says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He will lift you up. So many times we want to lift ourselves up. You know, we want to just, I got this. I've done this, you know, especially in our ministries. And I, I have all this experience and trust me, I've, I've been doing this for 10 years and I, you know, I, I, I know you know, and we, it's just this pride that begins to build up within us. And yet God says, man, humble yourself and I will lift you up. Give me the opportunity because really what's happening is we're taking all of the opportunity away from God. We're saying, look how great I am. Look how awesome I am. Look at what I've done. And we're not allowing the Lord any opportunity to do something neat. Because of that, the Lord exalted Jesus. He lifted him up. Verse 12 and 13. Again, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, so you were always obedient, whether I'm there or not. Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is... God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. J. Vernon McGee said, you cannot be like God by imitation, but by impartation. And I love that. Let me say it again. J. Vernon McGee said, you cannot be like God by imitation, but by impartation. See, a lot of times we sit there and we go, I need to just copy God. I need to copy and just kind of act like a Christian acts, you know, and how long does that last? How many of us have tried that? 
it, it lasts maybe a couple hours, right? <laughs> it lasts till we get on the freeway, you know? It lasts till we, till we see that relative, you know? And then it like goes, it's all gone. And a lot of times we try to do it by imitation. But I love that, that we can't do it by simply copying the Lord. We, he has to literally give us his mind. He has to give us his heart. He has to let this heart be in us that was also in him. He has to wipe away everything that we once were, everything that we, you know, the, the way that we thought, the way that we acted, our mentality. And he has to put his same thought process, his same heart, his same mind within us. And it's so neat because it's then at that point that the Lord begins to work. And yes, it's a work, as Paul's saying, work it out, work out your own salvation with trembling and fear, with caution. But he says what? He says that it's God, the one that works in you. It's God, the one is, that's the one that does all the work in you and through you. And again, all we do is we just step back and we give God the opportunity. You, know, you can say, man, Rowan, trust me, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I'm just, I'm never as good as you guys here at church. And many times I hear that. I hear guys just go, man, I just, you know, I just can't do it. And I've tried, you know, and I just give up. And then I come back and then I leave and then I come up. You know, it's like, man, it's imitation. You're trying too hard, honestly. I don't try that hard, man. That's exhausting. <laughs> it has to be directly the Lord doing the work. Well, how? Well, so what do I do then? You ask. Ask, seek, and not. You say, Lord, give me your mind. Lord, give me your heart. Lord, give me your thought process. Give me your humility. You continue to seek him through his word. And trust me, he will be faithful to give that to you. Verse 14 says this. Now the test. Ready? Because of all this, therefore, verse 14, do all things without complaining and disputing. This is the test, right? Pass or fail. How are you guys doing so far? We don't grade on a curve. Again, therefore, 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 because of. And it's funny because you know, everything that Paul wrote up until this point is also that this verse would make sense to us. Everything he wrote. This is who God is. This is who Jesus is. He's great. He's mighty. He's God in the heavens and earth. And, and, and he's amazing. And he gave it all up. And he humbled himself. And he came to this earth. And he, Paul wrote all of this. So this one verse would make sense. So that you, believer, can do all things without complaining or disputing. Hmm. Because honestly, you guys, without all that, this verse to me doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. I want to complain. <laughs> I want to dispute. Let's, let's battle. Let's, let's do it. You know, let's, let's debate it out and let's see who's right. And, you know, and, and let's have fun. And a lot of times we're like that. But Paul gives you the test here. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Why? Why, Paul? Well, because Christ, being God, gave up his life and came to this earth and humbled himself as a slave for you. Because Christ gave you comfort of love. Because Christ gave you that mercy. Now you, believer, step back and do all things without complaining. Like, man, Roman, I was on board with you with the humility and Jesus is awesome. But no complaining? Oh, gosh. No disputing, no arguing. Eesh. That's kind of hard now. That the believers, the church, the bride of Christ would work together with one common goal, with joy, with joy. Why? Because Jesus humbled himself. And you know what, guys? This is what the church needs. Paul sat back and as he wrote the book of Philippians, he said, he said, I'm, I'm sure 
with a lot of thought and consideration, he said, what am I going to write about? What am I going to say? I don't need to rebuke them. There's not sin that I'm hearing about from uh, Epaphroditus or, or Timothy that I sent to them. There's no, you know, doctrinal things that need to be worked out. What in the world do I write about to them? And the main point that he came up with was unity, was humility, was doing all things without complaining. Why? So that they would give the opportunity to the Lord to do more work, to do a greater work than what had already been done. See, a great work was already done, right? We already said that, that they, it used to just be a small group of women that met by the river's edge and they came together in prayer and stuff and now it was a full-blown congregation. God already did such an amazing work. And the one thing that Paul had an opportunity to write about to them was this unity, was this humility for them to humble themselves. Why? So that they could step back and that God could do something even more amazing than what he had already done. And that is what is so neat about the Lord, is that he's never through, right? He's continually working. So wherever you're at right now with the Lord, wherever you are with God, be comforted that he is not done with you. He has greater things for you. He has better things ahead of where you are. And I don't care where you are or what you've been through or where you've been or whatever. It doesn't matter. God has greater things. But what he desires for you is to step back, humble yourself, and allow the Lord to work. That's the way it gets done. Verse 15 says that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Paul says that you may be blameless and harmless. Harmless. I love that. So that word so is so interesting to me that he used there. Harmless. Underline that in your Bible. Because if I wrote it, I would have said, so that you may be blameless and right. Right? Do all these things, do do A, B, and C so you can be blameless and right. So you can be blameless and honored and respected, lifted up. So you can be blameless and in charge, right? So you can be the one calling the shots. But Paul didn't tell that to them. And you would think that's the way to motivate people, right? <laughs> but the way Paul motivates them is that you can be blameless and harmless. And that thought is that you would be blameless and that you would be safe that you would be safe. Think about that. That through this crooked and perverse generation, he says, through this world that wants nothing but to harm you and destroy you and bring you low and bring you down and chew you up and spit you out, that wants to just take advantage of you in every way possible, that you believer would be harmless, that you Christian would be safe, you know what that means? It means that your employer would trust you. How about that? That when your employer goes, man, we have all this overtime right now. You know, who do we give it to? Unsupervised, no one's going to be around, just one person. Do they go, let me give it to you because they're trustworthy? I know I can trust them. Or do they go, you know, don't give it to the Christian because, you know, they'll just read their Bible the whole time and, and be on Facebook, you know? They go, man, we have this really important file, this delicate file that we have. Who can we trust with the information? Do they give it to you because you're trustworthy and because they know that, that you know, that, that, that you can be trusted with vital information and that you won't say anything? Or do they go, man, don't, don't give it to the Christian because they're always talking about everyone's business, you know? They're always bringing all the gossip up. Paul says that you would be safe 
and harmless as a believer. He says it in not complaining and not disputing, not arguing, that people would be able to trust you. It means that people wouldn't be afraid of coming up to you and asking you for prayer and asking you to minister to them and asking you for encouragement. That they know that if I go to so-and-so, they'll do nothing but be honest with me. They'll love me. They won't condemn me. They won't beat me down about things. But they'll just simply be honest with me, pray for me, and encourage me and lift me up. That people would be safe in your presence. Yeah, but I just want a little bit of fear. I want a little bit of respect. You know, don't we do that? Like, I just want people to respect me. Paul says he rejoices in your humility. He rejoices in the humility that you have. Verse 17 says, yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know uh, your state. For I have no one like-minded. I, I will sincerely care for your state. For, I will, uh, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know that, that you know his, speaking of Timothy, uh, proving character. That as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Paul's basically saying that, you know, he doesn't mind all the sacrifice, all the work, all the toil. It is so much joy for him to see the growth in the Philippian church. And he even says that he prays that they would take joy as well in the growth and the work that Christ is doing in and through them in his life. How does your life impact others? Do you challenge others by your life? Or are you simply a challenge? You know, because there's a difference, right? <laughs> you can either be a challenge, like, oh, no, there comes so-and-so. Or you can challenge people to be better, to do more, to seek the Lord. You know, how neat that when others look at you and they see your peace and they see your love and they see your comfort and they see your relationship with the Lord and they see your faithfulness to the ministry, that they can simply just go, man, I want what they have. And how, how are they just always smiling? How are they always joyful? Or do you come in this place just grumpy? You know, always wanting to be encouraged yourself. Always wanting to take, take, take. Humble yourself. Allow the Lord to do a work. Abraham Lincoln said this. I'll speak loud. Is it on? No? Yeah. Uh, he said, what kills a skunk is the publicity it gives itself, right? That makes sense. <laughs> what kills a skunk is the publicity it gives itself, right? The skunk goes, hello, I'm here. You know, a lot of times we tout ourselves. We just go, look how awesome I am. I'm here. And everyone goes, oh, I know you. I know you're not really that great. You know, I know you're not really that awesome. Humility is the one thing that Paul wrote to the church there in Philippians that he just wanted so much for them to grasp. And I truly believe it's the one thing that the Lord will do so much work and, and, and just so much through as we learn and as we practice. Verse two, I'm gonna leave you with this. Verse two, again, as we read it earlier, it says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let's pray.
Father, how do we grasp humility, Lord? Lord, how do we learn to just be humble, to humble ourselves and and exalt others before us and put others' needs in front of our own, Lord? And truly, God, it only comes by putting on you, by learning, by being having the things imparted to us that you are that example of as you walked upon this earth. Father, we just thank you right now, Lord, that God, that you didn't just sit up in your heavens looking down at us and you didn't just say, well, good luck. I gave you the garden. I gave you perfection. Work it out now. Lord, you loved us so much that you were willing to give up the heavens, that you were willing to come down to this earth and put on the image of a slave to humble and submit yourself to even men, to even death, Lord, on the cross. That you loved us so much, God. You were willing to be that example. Father, we pray, Lord, that if anything, that we would just take that example today and that we would say, Lord, help me to humble myself. That it would not be all about what we have done, what we have accomplished in this life, where we have been, that we would stop trying to sell ourselves, Lord, and we would just simply try to say, I am what I am by the grace of God. Lord, that it would be all about you from this moment on. Lord, that we would find that brother, that sister, that is that challenge to us, that challenges us in this life to do better, to go farther, to go deeper, Lord, in our relationship with you. And that, God, that we would just grasp onto them, that we would hold on and never let them go, Lord, because they are so rare in our lives. Father, we just pray for humility, Lord, within this body here. We thank you, God, for the work that you will do through it, Lord. We pray all this in your name. Amen.